The phrase causal inference is a bit misleading in, in that it could mean, like many English phrases, it could mean a bunch of different things because you can't tell what the function of the word causal there is. So there's causal inference, meaning our goal is to infer causes. And then there's the issue that all inference requires causal information. So in that sense, all inference is causal. And uh, so a, an easy example would be, um, we need to know what produce the sample that we're trying to describe. So uh, uh, issues like simply describing or predicting the weather means that we need to know the data we're using to produce those predictions, uh, what produced them? And was that process biased? Uh, are there uh, features of measurement error or missing data in that sample? Uh, the solutions to those problems are causal themselves, even though the goal is not a causal inference. Um, one of the examples I often use is uh, uh, missing data uh, of various kinds. So the simplest case would be something like um, we're surveying students on how much money they make. And uh, I assume students will watch this. And some of them decline to respond. Uh, if the reasons they've declined to respond are because of their income, because say they, they're incredibly wealthy and they're embarrassed uh, by the amount of money they have relative to their peers, uh, then we need to take that into account to describe the population. It, it wouldn't work to simply ignore the missing data. Um, that's the simplest sort of case. Uh, one that's incredibly common in research is censoring. So censoring just means we haven't observed an outcome that would happen in time. So uh, the toy example I like to use is pet adoptions. Uh, something I, I understand lots of people are doing uh, recently. <laughs> and uh, so uh, animal shelters have pets um, that they've either picked up on the streets or have been donated to them. And they keep careful records. And over time, animals of different types are adopted. And if we go into these records and try to figure out which animals are adopted at which rates, merely a descriptive question or a predictive question, how many cages do we need to buy and how much medicine and food? Um, there will be a number of animals that have not yet been adopted. And in this sense, the adoption event has been censored in the data. If we uh, just take the adoption events that happened and, and how long it took the animal to be adopted and just take an average of that, uh, we get the wrong answer because we've ignored the missing events, the missing um, adoption events, so those events that have been censored. This is a case where, uh, like the income case, structurally it's the same because that in both of these cases, the reason the observation is missing is because of its value. <laughs> and this thing happens in all kinds of data sets. It's incredibly common. Um, very large data sets, uh, administrative data sets are full of these sorts of censoring events. And the solution to them is to think causally about what produces delays and the rates. And then there's a, a very well-known way to deal with it statistically that's built into lots of software, but it's causal thinking that produces that solution. Another example where causal thinking is needed to do descriptive analysis or predictive analysis is in merely describing the demography of a population. This is especially true for, for the sort of science that I do, but it, it's true even in, in uh, contexts like Germany that when you ask people basic demographic information like their age and their income, you don't get exact answers. And it's not necessarily that people are trying to lie to you, although sometimes they do, but they just may not remember. So age is one that's quite famous in demography for being something that uh, you just can't take for granted administratively the age that you have for a person. And this may be hard to imagine now in some place like Germany where there are social birth records, and, but this has not always been true. Even quite recently in European history, there have not been official birth, birth certificates. And so for very old people in many parts of Europe, we don't know how old they are. And so you ask them their ages and they come up with a number that is not impossible, but it's maybe not exactly right either. Um, this is true in many parts of the world where there are no birthdays. It's just not culturally appropriate for people to celebrate their birth. It's a bit narcissistic, right? And uh, uh, so this is common for anthropologists like myself. We go to communities and we try to do the full demography of the community. And we ask people their ages, but we can't believe the numbers because people themselves don't keep track of that information. They sort of know what life stage they're in, what culturally denoted life stage they're in. So to figure out people's ages, which we need to do, 
we have to use causal information. And that, and that causal information is biological structure. It's a wonderful fact of human biology that everybody has exactly two parents <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that uh, your siblings are born in a particular order. And so if, if you know someone's parents and uh, their siblings and the birth order of those siblings, you can then typically in an entire community narrow down people's ages within the margin of error of a birth interval. That is the, the typical spacing between siblings. Uh, but that depends upon causal information. If, if there, you were another kind of organism, like a coral, all the rules would be different because coral clone themselves, right? <laughs> and so figuring out the age of a coral would be much harder. For humans, it's simple because we're simple animals. A quite paradoxical case of where uh, causal thinking is needed, uh, both to get the right answer and, and also uh, just to get the right description, is in life expectancy. And this is a, another obsession of ours in, in anthropology and human biology. So human societies uh, throughout history and, and globally now have very different demographies and life expectancies. And this isn't surprising to anyone. Understanding the causes of those differences is quite difficult, though. And even accurately just describing um, uh, how demography, uh, how life proceeds in different places. So a common statistic would be life expectancy at birth or at five years old or pick any age. How many more years of life does a person in a particular place expect? Um, this is an interesting sort, sort of statistic because it hides a lot of complexity and in inference. So the, the basic contrast that is common both in human societies and in, in all animal societies is that as the... So imagine 100 babies uh, or, you know, 100 baby monkeys or 100 baby fruit flies, whatever you like. And they're going to age together now. So in a population in which there's a lot of mortality, um, there will be a filtering effect where only the strongest babies will survive. If you can think about it that way, they won't be babies after a while, but uh, so on. And so by the time you look at the population and it's reached half of the maximum lifespan of the species, the individuals who remain will be very robust. They'll be among only the strongest because only the strongest could, could survive. And then their additional life expectancy will be very high. Uh, possibly even higher than it would be someplace like Germany, where almost everybody survives to, to be middle-aged uh, because it's a quite benign environment. This distinction, we talk about environments that are harsh and apply intense filtering on populations and populations uh, uh, and places which are, are quite benign and apply very little filtering. So life expectancy in the harsh places is lower, but the life expectancy doesn't just describe anybody's typical experience because there'll be heterogeneity in how robust individuals are for reasons that are, could be totally exogenous. It could just have to do with nutrition or, or uh, uh, parental history. Um, but no individual will experience the typical life expectancy because there'll be a massive spread around it. Uh, and so it's, it gives you very poor information about the population. Whereas in a place like um, uh, Northern and Western Europe, uh, where there's access to medical care and very little infant mortality, then um, life expectancy is very informative of a typical life course. So this, this problem of, of heterogeneity and how robust individuals are and how that interacts with the harshness of the environment, it, it messes up basic description of what life expectancy is and what it means. But it also frustrates attempts to, to understand the causes of aging. So uh, uh, something that comes up all the time is the issue of what medicine does for us. Right. Obviously, medicine's a good thing. And it does a lot for us. But if you're trying to do comparisons between societies that have robust access to medical care and those that don't, there are many other things that are different, including the filtering produces a population uh, in a harsh environment. The, the demographic filtering produces an older population, which is healthier, potentially, than the aging population of a wealthy country like Germany. And this is a paradoxical, but it arises because of this censoring effect. Uh, in effect, that, that individuals uh, who can't survive in harsh environments are censored from the old population. They don't exist, and therefore they don't need medical care, as it were. So when, when we think about analyzing data, uh, either to describe a population or to understand what, what has caused a particular phenomenon, um, there's really no way to get the answers out of the data itself. And uh, there's this philosopher of science named Nancy Cartwright who has a great saying that uh, no causes in, no causes out. And uh, I go for an even bigger version of this, which is no causes in, nothing out. 
Uh, you can't describe populations without causal information. You can't understand um, the causes of phenomenon without causal information. You have to put that in because the data itself are just associations. And associations don't have direction, and therefore they can't teach you causes.